Well, greetings. My name is Peter Hay, and I'm standing here in the sanctuary of the United Methodist Congregation that meets in Wilmington, Massachusetts, as we prepare our weekend worship video for this, the second Sunday in Lent. It is our hope and it is our prayer that you'll find these moments meaningful and uplifting and uh, giving you strength to live your Christian life, even in these challenging days. And uh, now I would invite Elizabeth and Ben to lead us in our opening prayer of confession and our opening hymn. Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, and renew our holy vessels, which include the communities of which we are a part. Let us pray. God of all, you created us for each other. You sent in us a yearning for companionship and an empathy that binds us together, protecting each other and delighting in one another. Yet, too often we have broken down our relationships instead of building them up. We have been set against one another with the lie of scarcity. We have built systems and economies that widen the gap of resources rather than safeguarding equitable practices. Too many and growing numbers are suffering hardship, food insecurity, joblessness. We cannot fathom the proportions of loss, and so we look away, sometimes even from the need in our own community. Help us, healer. Show us our empathy. Forgive our complacence us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Amen. 
Again this week, I invite you to imagine a warmth begin to arise within the core of your body. It may help you to keep your eyes closed. This warm orb of light is deep within you. A flame always there and ready when you need it. This warm glow begins to emerge from the recesses of your inner being to fill and flood your whole body until your skin is glowing with it. Radiating outward. This warmth that wraps you as a blanket of assurance is one you want to share. You want all to feel this presence, to kindle this hope. Know this. This love and security is meant for all people. No matter what. We are capable of sharing our light and not running out of enough. Christ's hospitality that broke through false boundaries points the way for you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you. And breathe out with the relief of assurance. I invite you to imagine the warmth that surrounds you extending to those who may be next to you in close proximity. Imagine it extending beyond your walls to the neighborhood, the wider community, the church, and seeing it spread like the rising sun. Let it expand to all the world. Let this be our peace. Amen. If you have not already, I invite you to open your eyes. The peace of Christ is with you. Please join now in our opening hymn, number 496, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
Our scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Oh, for the wonder. 
Well, hello, uh, welcome. This is the time where we come to for the children and for the uh, childlike spirit that's in each of us. So for the children out there, you might think back to last week. I know it's been a while. I struggled to remember a week ago, but last week we talked a bit about breathing, not just like we do all the time. Hopefully we all breathe all the time, but about deep breaths as a way to kind of heal to take a rest, to take a moment, and to remember God's love for us. So let's start off by doing that real quick. <sighs> it's nice, right? <laughs> well, today we're going to keep talking about God's love, but we're going to talk about not so much remembering God's love, but where we can find God's love and where God's love is. So I am here recording this for you in the church, in the sanctuary, I'm guessing for most of you, you're watching from home. Unfortunately, that's the way things are right now. You know, uh, I said we're here in the sanctuary. You might not know, did you know sanctuary is a word that means more than just a great big room in a church. Sanctuary means a safe place. So you can have all sorts of sanctuaries. You can have a bird sanctuary. You can have wildlife sanctuaries. We have sanctuaries for immigrants and people in need so that they can go. And all those places are is just a safe place for different animals and different people and even habitats and uh, landscapes. We have all sorts of sanctuaries. Anything that needs to be kept safe can be, you can have a sanctuary for it. And so this sanctuary here at the church is our safe space. However, a few months ago, we had to make the tough call to say it would be kind of silly, right, if we were gathering in a sanctuary a safe place, and we weren't totally certain that it was making everyone that's here safe. So that's why we're doing things from home and recording and putting our video online on the weekends is so that we can be sure and provide a safe place for you. But because the reason that we're able to do that is because we know that this sanctuary for God, no matter how big it is or how pretty or how nice it is, it's still just kind of another room for God because God doesn't need to be in the sanctuary here, just like you don't need to be in the sanctuary to be at church with your church family. God can be anywhere. You can be camping on a mountaintop in Asia, and God can be there, and you can, I guess, join in church. You might struggle to get cell reception to join our video, but you can have church there. It's not a, a church sanctuary, but God is there. So I want to ask you, I bet if you're like me and you're sitting on a couch, you probably have a pillow or a blanket or something nearby. I'm here. I have this. This is a prayer shawl that some wonderful people in our church made. And we, a few weeks ago in our service, we had a blessing for our prayer shawls. These, these are knitted. And as they knit them, they pray for people that the people that receive them are usually going through some difficult time. They're struggling. And it's a way that those people can have this blanket and feel the warmth of it and feel God's love and know that they're cared for and that they are in a safe space. So I want you to reach out and grab a blanket or a pillow or anything nearby you. And let's, as you hold that blanket or pillow or whatever you've got, let's give it a great big hug. Can you do that? And as you do, I want you to pretend like it's your big church family, that you're just giving a great big hug. Because even though we're not here in the sanctuary together and we all miss it greatly from pre-pandemic times, we know that we're doing it because we want to be safe and that God, no matter where we are, whether we're in church or at home or on a mountain, we know that God is there to keep us safe as well. So I want you to hold that blanket and we're going to close in prayer. If you could just repeat after me as we pray. Loving God, please bless these blankets so that whenever we wear them, we can feel the warmth of your love. We can feel the healing touch of your hands. And we can feel safe to be our truest selves. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the centurion in uh, 
Matthew's gospel is rather bold. And that turns out to be a good thing. He approaches Jesus with no reason to believe that Jesus would honor his request. Jesus is Jewish. Jesus is gathering to himself a community of Jewish people, striving to live up to the highest ideals of that ancient tradition. There are some things about this centurion that just might put him beyond the pale of Jesus' mission. The centurion is not a follower of Christ. The centurion, in all likelihood, is not Jewish. He is almost certainly a Roman citizen and the leader of an army that is occupying the homeland. Can't you just imagine the objections coming as this centurion makes his way to Jesus? Maybe the disciples are a little cranky. Oh, don't waste your time on him. He, he's not one of us. He does not follow our way of life. He doesn't buy into the vision and the mission statement and the critical issues we voted on last week at our disciples board meeting. Can't you just see the reluctance, the hesitancy by the disciples? But Jesus doesn't honor the request of his disciples. Now, there's considerable debate about the best way to interpret verse 7. As was read for us from one translation, it is, I will come and cure him. However, there's a fairly good chunk of scholars who take the same verse and say that's not quite accurate. They would render the verse as, I should go and cure him. The implication being that, that Jesus knows he ought to do it, but that there are some good reasons why Jesus might not do it. I remember studying Greek. I studied it for four years in college. And uh, um, in the original manuscripts, you know, there's no space between the words. And uh, they hadn't developed punctuation yet. So an accurate translation of this Greek, these Greek passages is, uh, is tricky at best. And I would say one thing about both scholars, both camps of scholars who see this verse differently, that their Greek is much more proficient than mine, so I'm not a good arbiter of the argument. But the latter of the two options, the one that suggests Jesus is a little reluctant, I should do this, but I'm not going to. Well, it just might be for all the reasons I mentioned above. Might the Jewish people think ill of Jesus if he embraces this centurion? centurion? Would they question Jesus' patriotism? Might they see Jesus as either a traitor or at least a sympathizer to this occupying force? And would his perceived compassion for this Roman threaten his standing among the Jewish folk he was trying to reach with the gospel? 
No, if we take this verse the way the second batch of scholars suggest, it makes the centurion's response a little more intelligible. When he says, you know, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home, but I don't think you really need to go to my house to do what I'm asking of you. You only need to say it, and it will be so. And he draws an, ex an example from the life of a centurion. Just as I have authority over those that I command, so you too have authority over the healing powers. You only need to speak healing, and it is done. That makes sense to me out of the flow of the conversation. But like I said, uh, my Greek is far less proficient than most scholars. But when the, assured, when the centurion says that, Jesus is amazed. We don't get that very often in the New Testament. Jesus is amazed. Usually people are amazed at Jesus. But Jesus is amazed at the faith of this centurion. He goes on to say, I tell you, no one else in Israel, in no one else in Israel have I seen such faith. I tell you, that when all things are made right in God's future, many people like him will be rejoicing. And many of the so-called insiders, well, they just might be left out. Now, please don't take what Jesus says as literal. The way he's constructing his response is really to highlight the faithfulness of the centurion, saying that his way of being is a model, that we should all aspire to have a faith like his, to understand that the power of God is unfolding in the person of Jesus. The centurion is bold. He comes with no reason to believe Jesus would receive him. And he's even assertive with Jesus when Jesus is reluctant. And that amazes Jesus. Don't you want to amaze Jesus? Don't you want him to look at you with that same type of affirmation? Well, boldness, boldness is what amazed him. I told a story uh, on Wednesday night with our Soup and Spirit group. That's a group of us that met for a Zoom discussion. And uh, as I told the story, people in the group were so uh, enthralled with it that I think I'd like to share it with everyone else. So if you've already heard it, you can tune me out for a few moments. It's a story told by Diana Butler Bass, and she's one of my favorite writers. She tells us of Onesius, an African who had, been in, who had been enslaved and brought to Boston in the early 1700s. And this enslaved person had a conversation with one of the leading ministers in the city of Boston, Cotton Mather. And Boston was experiencing one of the many smallpox pandemics that would break out frequently in that city at that time. Onesimus, the enslaved African, told the preacher, Cotton Mather, about a practice that he'd learned 
in his homelands in Africa. Africans would take a little bit of the pock juice from someone who was inflicted with the disease and introduce it into the body of an uninfected person. He said, these folks would get a little sick, but no one ever died. And soon, smallpox vanished from the village. Onesimus was bold as he shared that story with Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was quite fascinated by this, and he, he confirmed the practice by talking frequently with others of African descent. And there was even a great deal of writing being done about inoculations in Turkey, and Cotton Mather paid close attention to that. Mather was convinced that this practice was right, and he began to advocate for it throughout the city of Boston. Cotton Mather was bold in advocating for this practice. While most doctors, we're told, in the city of Boston were reluctant to embrace it, in fact, they were very hostile toward the idea. But Mather was able to convince Dr. Boylston that the practice was good. And so convinced was Dr. Boylston that he actually had one of his servants and his own son inoculated successfully. Diana Butler Bass goes on to give us the statistics. In 1721, the population of Boston was 11,000. More than half of the city had contracted smallpox, and 850 died from the disease. That is, 15% of those who had contracted the disease died. And Mather and Boylston had inoculated 287 people, and only 2% of those who had been inoculated had died. And of the study, uh, one Harvard professor writes, Mather and Boylston's advocacy and observations resulted in what was actually one of the earliest clinical trials on record and the use of both experimental and control groups to demonstrate the effectiveness of inoculation significantly aided in the adoption of the practice. I am very glad that Onesimus, that Cotton Mather, and Dr. Boylston were bold. And I think we're all the better for it. Boldness is good. Boldness is what amazes Jesus. <clears throat> I'd like to close my sermon by introducing you to a new word, and I'd like to encourage us all to adopt it. That word is kindom. Kindom. By dropping the G out of kingdom, we can open ourselves to see a new and a, a better way of life, the way of life that this centurion found in Jesus. You see, the word kingdom implies an alignment of power, that the king is on the throne at the very top of the chain of command. Kingdoms are often established by military might. They are governed by domination and coercion. Kingdom implies an inherited wealth and power. 
and kingdoms rage against one another whenever there is warfare. But if we drop the G, if we realize, like the centurion, the day he met Jesus, that powerful governments and strength are not the things that bring us together and bring us healing and hope. What does that is the simple recognition that we are all kin to one another. We are all family under God's gracious reign. May we live that truth boldly, as boldly as the centurion did when he approached Jesus. May we live that truth as boldly as Onesimus did, as Cotton Mather did, as Dr. Boylston did. For we are kin to one another in the vastness of our loving God. Amen. Well, we here at the Wilmington United Methodist Church continue to be so grateful for your generous support. It is through your ongoing giving that we are able to continue to be in ministry even through this, uh, this difficult season. I know of at least three ways if you'd like to support the church. One would be to go to our website and you can follow the prompts for online giving. The second is you can go to your bank and you can use perhaps a bill pay service or the online banking and you can designate a gift to the church and some have found it helpful to set up their reoccurring gifts um, as they would do if they were able to attend each week. And then there's always the old fashioned way. You can uh, write out a check and you can mail it to the church office. But please know however you choose to give that your gifts matter and because of your generosity, we continue to thrive in ministry. And we are indeed grateful. So thank you very much. Well, as we enter into our time of prayer, we would like to offer an invitation. Um, in normal times when we're gathered in the sanctuary, we would have an opportunity for prayer requests and celebrations. 
And unfortunately, we can't do that right now, but we just want to extend the offer that our office is always open. If there is something that comes up in your life that you would like prayer for or have to celebrate, we would love to know that so that we can join you in prayer. And if it's not something too personal or uh, private, we can even include it in our video, bearing in mind that that is uh, published to the internet for all to see. <laughs> but that is always an invitation and an offer that is open to you as we go through our days in this pandemic. Now would you enter into a prayer with me and bow your heads. Healer of our every ill, especially our malady of separation and fear, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recover from the toxicities and grief of our time. As broken pieces scattered and separated, we trust that you are seeking us, gathering us into wholeness, and calling us to join you in the quest. We pray especially for those who have experienced the loss of livelihoods and economic security, and who are feeling helpless to care for their families. We pray for those whose businesses have gone under or are on the precipice between survival and closure. We pray for those whose despair disparity of resources has been made even more pronounced during this pandemic, and we pray grateful thanks for the efforts of all who have been searching for solutions and have given generously for months of their time and resources to alleviate the suffering of those they know and those they do not know. We ask for encouragement and passion to reevaluate how we as a church can help now and into the future. We pray this day for those needs in our community and our congregation that are on our hearts and minds, spoken and unspoken. And as we were taught, we are bold now to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our closing hymn today is hymn number 377, It Is Well With My Soul.
It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And the Lord haste the day. It is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well. It is well with my soul. Would you receive this commission? We know that Jesus' actions and his deeds in the Bible often receive a lot of buzz from onlookers. In this week's story, uh, we don't know how his followers and believers reacted to his words, but we can assume that it was hard for some to hear. Jesus points out in the story that the belief of this outsider far exceeds the belief and the faith of many of his insiders, from those who profess to be faithful. His words no doubt affirmed some and offended others. That's what happens when we get called out, as we say. Perhaps we are in need at times of being called out, not in the way that shames, but in the way that energizes us. I ask, how can our faith call us out more and more until we, as people of faith, can no longer stand by as others are suffering? Now go with confidence that the holy beachcomber is gathering us all for safekeeping, recovering our depths of love for all and our joy for living in this world. And may the words of Jesus ring in your ears, I will come. And may the Spirit hover, move, and deliver and solve your soul in the spring of your step. Amen.